July 1943. Victory in North Africa has the Allies ready to breach Fortress Europe and bring the fight to the Axis powers. The Allies' plan is to hit Sicily in the south and then begin advancing up the mainland. It's a plan in part relying on the help of one of the most notorious gangsters in America and his criminal empire. It's a case of making a pact with the devil. Anybody who criticizes this plan doesn't realize the needs of war. This is war. You gotta win. This is the story of mob boss Lucky Luciano and the astonishing secret coalition that the US Navy never wanted told. The 7th of December, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Following two years of internal debate over the nation's involvement in the war, American President Franklin Roosevelt's hand is forced and the US enters the global conflict. From the moment the United States engages in the Second World War after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, we are then, as a country, confronted with a two-front war, one in the Pacific, one in Europe. Even before the Imperial Japanese Army's deadly attack, the US had been supplying the British and the Russians in their fight against the Nazis. An effort that sees many supply vessels crossing the Atlantic attacked by German submarines. With the US now officially entering the war, sightings of deadly U-boats off the eastern shores of the country rapidly increase, raising concerns that they are being assisted in their efforts by enemy sympathizers secreted within immigrant communities on land. People are saying, there's a German submarine off New Jersey? How is that submarine operating so far from Germany? You have spies being arrested in New York in January 1942 after a counter-espionage operation. People are fearful about that. If the German submarines can cut off American trade, think about what that'll do to the food supply of the country. So that's why you're gonna get all efforts to protect the East Coast, stop sabotage, stop the German submarines. Any means we can do it, we're gonna to try to do it. The 9th of February, 1942. Manhattan's West 48th Street Pier. The SS Normandy is on fire. The French luxury liner is being refitted as an American troop transport with the intention that it will play a vital part in the war effort. As the crew abandons ship, fears quickly spread amongst the horrified onlookers about the cause of the blaze. Just months after Pearl Harbor, the burning of the SS Normandy was a major setback for the naval forces in New York, so they had to take this very seriously. The Normandy was the top of the pyramid in terms of feeding into the fear that was already present. The real issue with the Normandy fire is that it is sitting there now in the harbor. It's not just an eyesore, but it's something that reminds every New Yorker as they go past it, there's the Normandy, that burn, how did it burn? As anxiety across the city surges, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the ONI, is intent on uncovering how this happened. The great fear of naval intelligence was that the West Side docks particularly, which was the major seaport, might have been infiltrated by saboteurs and also Nazi or Italian partisans, longshoremen and the fishermen who used New York ports who were trying to help the submarine campaign. Knowing that the docks are vital to the war effort, the Navy's New York District Chief, Commander Charles Haffenden, sends his men down to conduct investigations among the workers. Naval intelligence had more than 100 agents trying to work the New York piers, and they were getting nowhere. They couldn't pass themselves off as longshoremen. They tried going to bars and meeting places, and they were easily made. They were, they were looked upon suspiciously. Frankly, they were desperate. Naval Intelligence Commander Haffenden really wanted to understand who runs the New York docks. And he famously said, I'll talk to anyone, a priest, a gangster, or the devil. 
And of course it was the Mafia. The Mafia had a long established labour union racket going on. So they were very much in touch with the docks and the dock workers. This discovery sets the stage for an extraordinary operation. Realising the scope of the Mafia's influence, Havenden makes contact with the mob. A tip-off leads him to Joe Sox Lanza, a top-ranking mafioso from Sicily, who controls the dock workers' union from the Fulton Fish Market. Fulton Fish Market was in the Lower East Side, and so it was very well placed for the Mafia. It was a very useful power hub. Joe Sox Lanza, he is in control of the, of the market. He also dominates the union. He is the man in that part of New York City. He was a mobster, no question about it. A violent man. Meeting in secret, Havenden approaches Lanza and asks for the Mafia's assistance in gaining his men access to New York's docks. Sox Lanza agrees to help, and soon undercover Navy intelligence officers are deployed among the dock workers and on fishing boats in an effort to uncover enemy exploits. Havenden officially names this covert alliance Operation Underworld. You have to understand, Mafia influence is not just restricted to the docks. They have interests in hotels, prostitution, gambling, restaurants. They have interests all over the city of New York and the rest of the East Coast. You have two Germans or Italian pro-fascists talking in an Italian restaurant over dinner. What better way to catch them than by having a waiter who is a O&I person but has obtained a union card through Joe Sox Lanza or somebody else serving them dinner. He overhears them, he finds out their plans. They can get people union cards to be anything they want. But the operation can only go so far. Haffenden's agents are limited to the Lower East Side. They need to cast a wider net that takes in the more vital West Side piers and the site of the Normandy fire. When the naval investigators came to Sox, Sox admitted he had no control over the West Side. That was run by other mob families. And he told them there's only one man who could flash the whip to make sure everything was OK on the West Side piers. And that's Lucky Luciano. A notorious overlord of organized crime, Charles Lucky Luciano is one of the most prominent mafia figures in America. But he is also in jail. Incarcerated in a maximum security prison, Luciano is serving a sentence of up to 50 years. Yet even from inside, he continues to exert considerable influence. For Haffenden and the Office of Naval Intelligence, turning to this unlikely ally is their best bet at securing the docks. But getting to him will not be easy. When it comes time to get Luciano recruited into this Operation Underworld, Joe Sox Lanza says, I can't do it. I'm not close enough to Luciano. The guy to get him is Meyer Lansky. Mayor Lansky is Lucky Luciano's closest friend and associate. The Jewish gangster and the Sicilian mobster had formed an unlikely alliance during their rise to power in the 1920s. And without Lansky's support, the operation will be derailed. Despite his own brutal activities, Mayor Lansky has a history of fighting against the fascists. Even before the war, he had been concerned about the rise of the German-American Bund, an American Nazi organization. The Jewish establishment in New York had sought his help to disrupt secret Bund meetings and rallies. Lansky would take fellow Jewish gangsters and break up these meetings. So really, from the uh, middle of the 1930s, he was very much involved in this anti-Nazi movement. And so when Commander Haffenden approached him, he, he didn't have to think twice about it. April 1942. Haffenden and Mayor Lansky's clandestine encounter is arranged to take place at the Hotel Astor in Manhattan. Here, Lansky offers his assistance and agrees to help secure the docks. In return, he asks only that Lucky Luciano gets transferred to the low-security prison in Great Meadows, New York. Once the transfer is complete, he'll approach the crime boss himself to make the case for the Mafia's wider support of Operation Underworld. 
May 1942, Lansky travels to Great Meadows Prison in upstate New York for a summit meeting with Luciano. Now, Lucky was no fool. He agreed to do this, but in return, he wanted something. Luciano was facing 30 to 50 years in jail. His parole would not be until 1956. He really hated being in this stinking, freezing cell. He wanted to get out. As far as he was concerned, World War II was a break for him because he actually had some influence and could maybe use that to get out of jail. Keeping his cards close to his chest, Lucky agrees to this alliance. He instructs Mayor Lansky to spread the word around the West Side docks that the mob is now a part of the war effort. Lucky used Lansky as his intermediary. Everybody in organized crime knew that when Maya Lansky delivered a message from Lucky that it was authentic, no question. Within weeks, mob enforcers are patrolling the waterfront, breaking strikes and bones if necessary. Naval intelligence agents are mingling with dock workers, looking out for spies, saboteurs, and submarines. Lucky's involvement has worked. And while Mayor Lansky's motives for opposing the Axis powers are clear, native Sicilian Luciano's reasons for facing off against the fascists are simple. He wants revenge. May 1942. Since the bombing at Pearl Harbor five months earlier, people living in coastal cities across the US have felt a grave sense of vulnerability. Nowhere more so than on New York City's waterfront. Fearing covert agents and enemy sympathizers are planning acts of sabotage, naval intelligence looked to secure the city's docks, a vital hub of the US war effort. To do so, Navy Commander Charles Haffenden turns to an unlikely ally, imprisoned mafia kingpin. Lucky Luciano. Anybody who criticizes this plan doesn't realize the needs of war. This is war. you got to win. For the Sicilian gangster, a chance to fight against the fascists was an offer he couldn't refuse. Following centuries of operating unopposed on the island of Sicily, Benito Mussolini's rise to power has threatened to put an end to the Mafia. The origins of the Mafia go back possibly with its name to the Middle Ages meaning strong men, men of honor. The Mafia was seen as patriotic, militant organizers who opposed foreign domination. There were novels written about them, plays written about them, in which they were, they were conceived of as noble figures. But by the 1890s, the patriots had evolved into oppressors. They had, in effect, become landowners and merged themselves with the existing authority, became politically important because they could bring out the vote. They had gotten into this system where there was a father, the boss, and underlings, and they were immune from any kind of legal authority. The Sicilian Mafia infiltrate the police systematically, and they also infiltrate the wealthiest business on the island which is the growing of lemons. It's a big export industry. This is some of the most valuable agricultural land in the whole of Europe, and it's perfect for protection rackets, where you create a fear, you smash the shop window, and then you say, I'll be the guy who protects you. The Mafia was notorious. While the Mafia may be the strongest force on the island, Sicily, as a province of Italy, now faces the same uncertainty thrust upon the whole country following the outcome of the First World War. Despite being on the winning side, Italy's participation in the conflict proves ruinous, and not even the reach or influence of the Mafia can affect the growing turmoil and political upheaval that ensues. Italy from 1999 is beset by land seizures, occupation of the factories, you have strikes, you have a government that is unable to cope with it because it doesn't have a real good party structure. There's fear of a communist revolution. Out of this chaos comes Benito Mussolini. He established the fascist movement in Milan. His platform is kind of a combination of nationalism, syndicalism, left-leaning ideologies. It's a pragmatic platform designed to draw people in. Mussolini organizes this vast movement of malcontents into this fascist movement. The black shirts forms them into squads. 
He's the unifying element. And what happens for the next two years, you have this battle between fascists and socialists. And the struggle mainly takes place in northern Italy. And it's brutal. Mussolini's black shirts attack socialist strongholds and establishment figures, often using barbaric tactics that create pandemonium in the country. Then in October 1922, the fascists march on Rome, threatening a coup d'etat. Mussolini's mentality and actions were basically the same as the mafias. Here he is telling people, you put me in power, you keep me in power, and guess what? The violence will end. It's a protection extortion racket. The king yields, legally naming Mussolini the new prime minister of Italy. He quickly sets about removing any opposition. Soon he has established a one-party state where he is Il Duce, the leader. Once established, Mussolini surveys his domain for any potential threats to his new totalitarian state. He finds that his most ruthless adversary occupies the southern island of Sicily. Well, Mussolini is very suspicious of the Mafia. It's useful to him as a way of controlling the Italian south, but it is a contending node of power. But now that he's in control, Mussolini refuses to tolerate any group who won't accept the absolute authority of the fascists. In 1924, he visits Sicily, and he goes to this little Italian village, Piana di Greci, and he meets with the local mafia boss, fixer, Francesco Cuccia. And Cuccia says, what do you have all these carabinieri, all these police and bodyguards around you? You're here under my protection. And Mussolini, being the Duce, being the supreme leader of Italy, admitting of no rivals, scorns Cuccia. So Cuccia, the next day when Mussolini is giving a speech to the assembled people of the village, orders them not to turn up. Mussolini's humiliating. I mean, he cannot tolerate a state within a state. This is May of 1924. Within weeks, he appoints Cesare Marti and says, go and destroy the mafia. Looking to gain control over the island, retired police chief Cesare Mori becomes the battering ram with which Mussolini assaults the Mafia. He had formerly headed task forces in Bologna and Rome. He's now given special powers and hundreds of lawmen to wage war on organized crime in Sicily. Cesare Mori was a very devoted policeman who had made his reputation principally fighting the Mafia and lawlessness in Western Sicily after the First World War. So he made a good front man for Mussolini's anti-mafia operation. There's no fair play here. Mori decides, I'm going to crush these guys. I'm going to out-mafia the Mafia in terms of violence and tactics and brutality. Mori is swift and ruthless sweeping through Sicily and arresting over 500 men within the first two months of the campaign. But it's the methods he employs in the criminal stronghold at Ganji that will go on to earn him another nickname, the Iron Prefect. The siege of Ganji, which takes place in 1926, is the classic example of what he does. He'll take women and children hostages in order to force people to surrender, but he wanted to shame the Mafia. He would burn their crops, kill their cattle. He would also use torture a method called the cassetta, a small box where the man was tied, soaked with brine, and then whipped in order to get a confession. He wanted to show the Sicilian people that the Mafia was not the only tough organization on the block. Over the course of Mori's violent campaign against the Mafia, some 11,000 suspected mafiosi are arrested. All these uh, Mafia suspects would be rounded up, they'd be put in uh, cages in courts, photographed, most importantly, and the stories put in the papers. Mussolini was a figure who wanted to be seen to do things, really, and so the purge against the Mafia was a story that went round the world. Now, this became an object lesson for the younger mafiosi, who could see that the future in Sicily was very dangerous and almost non-existent. And it led to an illegal exit. This exodus sees many of the mafiosi flee the onslaught and seek a new life in New York City. Here they encounter a tough young gangster who is radically shaping the future face of organized crime, Charles Lucky Luciano. The same gangster who 20 years later 
would play a crucial role in the Allies' assault against Mussolini. May 1942. Six years into a 30-year minimum jail term, mob kingpin Charles Lucky Luciano is collaborating from his cell with the United States government's war effort to fight against the fascists. Luciano has a reputation as one of the most feared gangsters in America, despite being incarcerated. And he has come a long way from his humble origins on the streets of New York City. Lucky Luciano's career was the quintessential success story of a major mobster in America. Lucky came to the U.S. as an immigrant from Sicily at the age of nine. His parents were peasants, and he was totally uninterested in school, and he dropped out at 14 and almost immediately began a life of primitive crime. He started up with street assaults, shaking down the vendors, burglaries, anything that he could pick up a buck. On the bustling streets of the Lower East Side, Lucky, then going by his given name of Salvatore Luciana, gets perfect on-the-job training for his future life as a crime boss. Here, he encounters young Jewish criminal Meyer Lansky in what will be his most significant and long-lasting underworld connection. Luciano and Lansky met as kids, basically. In fact, uh, Luciano was actually mugging Lansky, and Lansky said, you can go stick it. Luciano admired Meyer Lansky's toughness and thinking abilities. Luciano looks at Lansky and says, I don't really care if you're Jewish. You're not Sicilian. I don't care. You got a brilliant business mind. You're tough. You think well on your feet. I'm keeping you around. We're going to work together. And both of us are going to get rich. Luciano, with his new associate Lansky by his side, has a speedy rise within the underworld. Both are recruited to the infamous Five Points Gang, where they come to the attention of Giuseppe Masseria, otherwise known as Joe, the boss. Joe Masseria was a very stout, portly person, although he was fast on his feet and he was a trigger man. A lot of people wouldn't mess with him, very tough. Lucky Luciano becomes a gunman. Joe the boss uses him to shoot rivals and he gets that fearless reputation for extreme violence, which means he can step up. And step up, he does. By January 1920, Luciano is 22 years old and one of Masseria's top lieutenants. His ascent is timed perfectly as the American government votes to pass a law that hands organized crime its biggest opportunity for growth to date, prohibition. Prohibition was fundamental for the explosion of organized crime. You've just taken one of the most lucrative businesses and you've put it into the hands of gangsters. The illegal distilling, shipping and supplying of liquor is a gravy train for the gangs of New York. But in 1925, a wave of mafiosi fleeing Mussolini arrives from Sicily, and with them comes Salvatore Maranzano from Castellamare del Golfo. His traditional sensibilities and desire for power are crucial in shaping the American mafia and put him on a collision course with Joe the boss and his top lieutenant, Lucky Luciano. Maranzano was a very commanding figure, very tall, physically powerful, and he immediately set up his own family called the Castella Marese gangsters, and they became a rival force to Joe the boss. The rivalry came to a head in 1930. Masseria decided that it was time for him to organize and become the boss of all the Italian gangs in New York. The one person who stood up to him was Salvatore Maranzano. Now this ignited a bloody war that lasted for more than a year. Dozens of victims were killed or wounded. The result of this Castella Marese war was a lot of bodies on the street. That's not good for business. And so really people like Luciana and Lansky, who was always one for being very discreet, thought we've got to get rid of these firebrand leaders. In April 1931, Luciano targets his own employer, luring Joe the boss to a Coney Island restaurant. Following the meal, 
While Lucky is in the bathroom, four Jewish hitmen arrive and shoot Masaria dead. The war is over. So now, one of the two big leaders was gone. The only two big men left were Lucky Luciano and uh, Salvatore Maranzano. And uh, it didn't take long for Lucky to figure out that Maranzano was also somebody he couldn't trust. Believing he's won the war, Maranzano seeks total domination of the underworld. He organizes the Italian gangs of New York into the five families, declaring himself boss of all bosses and puts a contract out on Luciano. But in September 1931, Lucky and Lansky strike first, hiring a gang of Jewish hitmen to murder Maranzano in his office. Charles Lucky Luciano is now the most powerful gangster in America. He calls a meeting of all the families where he explains his one philosophy. The protection of the organization is paramount. To ensure this, he sets up the commission. The commission was the equivalent of the board of directors. It would consist of five New York families and two or three other families, Chicago, Buffalo, and they would rule on any conflicts between different families. And they would also rule on what the mafia would do. The theory was that the new mafia in America would be a carbon copy of American capitalism. So Luciano saw the future. He was in effect a mastermind. So in a single meeting, the American Mafia was born. Luciano is at the height of his powers, a multi-millionaire mob boss within a secure criminal empire. Yet the Mafia's fortunes quickly turn sour. Franklin D. Roosevelt is elected president in March 1933 and immediately brings an end to prohibition. The end of Prohibition brought the end to a massive cash cow. And Luciano and Lancy in particular were really looking at other forms of racketeering to make money. Uh, they moved into the sex business. Luciano wanted brothels as a chain store, so he was looking at making this a big thing. As Lucky looks to expand, the game is up. In 1935, the New York authorities conduct their first real crackdown on the Mafia spearheaded by Special Prosecutor Thomas Dewey, and his prime target, Luciano himself. Tom Dewey decided to investigate the New York brothels. There were over a hundred of them, and telephone taps came up with a bonanza of evidence against Lucky. In 1936, Dewey got an indictment against Lucky for aiding and abetting prostitution, and they went to trial, and Lucky was convicted and sentenced to a minimum term of 30 years to a maximum of 50 years. His outlook was very, very bleak. And it remains bleak until Commander Huffenden of US Naval Intelligence came calling six years later. New York, 1943, and the East Coast docks remain secure thanks to Luciano's involvement in Operation Underworld. In light of his cooperation with the war effort, a motion is put before the court to have Lucky's sentence reduced, but it's denied. The judge hints, however, that further assistance with the war effort may improve his chances of a future appeal. Almost immediately, an opportunity presents itself. Having defeated the Axis powers in Africa, the Allies are on the offensive. Their next target... Sicily. America, World War II. By January 1943, imprisoned Mafia boss Charles Lucky Luciano has been aiding US military intelligence for almost a year. Yet all he has to show for it has been a move to a minimum security prison. But developing events in Europe look to offer Luciano another chance to assist the war effort. The fight against Axis powers in North Africa has been bearing fruit. This encourages the Allied leaders to form a new strategy. Churchill said to Roosevelt that I think we should invade the soft underbelly of the fascist Nazi empire. And so they thought Sicily would be a good way of invading Europe. 
Operation Husky is fledged, and this plan is to take the U.S. 7th Army and the British 8th Army, hit Sicily in the south, and push the German divisions and the Italian divisions that are there out of Sicily back to the mainland. The planning of Operation Husky is underway. Roosevelt has communicated to Churchill that due to close cultural ties between the United States and Italy, the invasion should have a distinctly American flavor. And General Eisenhower is appointed commander-in-chief of the offensive. But the US military's first-hand knowledge of Sicily is thin. Using his Operation Underworld contacts, Commander Haffenden looks to gather intelligence from some of the many Italian immigrants already in the country. You have six million Italian Americans in the United States, many of which are Sicilians. You wanted their maps, you wanted their photographs, you wanted their diaries, you want to know about ports, you want to know about mountain passes and open roads. Haffenden and other guys try to approach these people and meet a brick wall. Haffenden turns to Luciano, who immediately gives his blessing for the Italian Americans to assist in Operation Husky. And a steady stream of Sicilian migrants arrive at naval intelligence offices to answer questions about the old country. The information gathered by Operation Underworld was very important. They got a lot of information on the coastline and the ports and really how things work. Not only do they give information about the terrain, by talking to these newly arrived Sicilians, you got a sense of how the mafia operated in Sicily, even though it was supposed to be destroyed. They are also telling, oh, I look, Sicilians have this innate love of the United States of America. The Americans are now realizing that maybe we will have a friendly populace that will greet us. And it's because of the informants. Whilst the information is being gathered, Luciano surprises Haffenden by proposing that he himself should participate in the military offensive. He suggested that he should be parachuted in to Sicily and that he should lead a fifth column of Sicilians against the Germans and the fascists. Unbelievably, Haffenden says, yes, I think we should do that. Convinced that Luciano's reputation carries enough weight in Sicily, Commander Haffenden argues the case for Lucky, insisting he be pardoned and sent to Sicily in advance of the invasion to rally local support. His request is denied. Sifting through all the material gathered, Havenden reports all movements of Operation Underworld to Washington. Soon after, a draft document of a new plan emerges from the Joint Chiefs of Staff called the Special Military Plan for Psychological Warfare in Sicily. It bears a striking resemblance to Lucky's fifth column proposal. Officially, the involvement of the Mafia in Operation Husky was denied, but a document of this plan is later discovered, proving it was a very real alliance. The intent of the plan is very simple. We're going to approach dissident elements in Sicily and the Sicilian Mafia. We're going to create a fifth column of pro-allied forces in Sicily so that they will help us in the invasion. We're going to contact those groups and we're going to arm them. We're going to tell them to blow up targets. So therefore, they will make the invasion easier. The plan actually works its way up the chain. It's amazing and it gets the approval of the Joint Chiefs, and it gets Eisenhower's approval. This is a document I found in the National Archives, and it was passed to the US Chiefs of Staff. Eisenhower saw this, and it very directly says that the US forces can work with clandestine forces, basically, and that includes the Mafia, and that they were to give them guns and explosives to carry out sabotage. Certainly no one could say that the US Chiefs of Staff did not know about working with the Mafia. The 9th of July, 1943. Operation Husky begins. The British and Canadian armies attack to the east while the Americans take the island from the south. The information supplied by Luciano and his Mafia associates proves vital to the success of the operation, and intelligence officers use his name as a code word when communicating with the local population and mafiosi. By mid-August, total victory on the island is achieved. Operation Husky is a major success, leading directly to the fall of Mussolini in Italy and providing the platform for the Allied push into Central Europe. In the aftermath of the invasion, stories of Lucky's involvement emerge on both sides of the Atlantic. 
the most striking is from Don Calo Vizzini, a local Sicilian mafia boss, who during the conflict recovers a package from a passing US plane, which contains a yellow pendant with a black L, the sign for Luciano. At the time, the US forces were facing a major confrontation with German and Italian troops at the nearby Monte Camarata. And so Don Carlo, once he saw this L, he sent his henchmen off to have a word with the Italian soldiers. And the very next day, it said these Italians disappeared, leaving only a handful of Germans. The Germans had to withdraw. And this is uh, shown to be an example of how Luciano's name could really make Italian troops disappear. The information gathered by Haffin and his group was extremely important. And you would have never gotten that without Luciano saying, I give my approval. Luciano and his contacts helps us to win the war. Without him, it would have been much more difficult struggle to get the island and to move on to the Italian campaign. This collaboration with the mob has provided ammunition for the Allies' victory. But for the people of Sicily, it will prove a double-edged sword. With the fall of the fascists come major consequences. Despite Mussolini's attempts to crush the Mafia, they have been waiting in the shadows, and now they have the chance to re-emerge. The Allied invasion of Sicily in July 1943 strikes a major blow against the Axis powers and is decisive in bringing down Mussolini. In planning the invasion, US naval intelligence had been covertly assisted by Sicilian mob boss Lucky Luciano, who remains languishing in Great Meadows Prison, New York. While the information he supplied helps the Allies liberate Sicily, the aftermath has opened the door for the Mafia on the island to return to prominence. The Allies, especially the Americans, were very naive. After the occupation of Sicily and driving out the Germans and the fascists, they were looking for people to replace the fascist administrators. And they uh, mistakenly believed that all these mafiosi who had been imprisoned were progressive democratic supporters. The people running the invasion, especially the Allied military government of occupied territories, AMGOT, didn't have the same level of knowledge about the Sicilians as did the people involved in Operation Underworld. So these officers want somebody to run the town, to keep order. So right away, Don Carlo Vizzini, for the example, is picked in Villa Alba. He's influential, he's wealthy, and who better to have anti-fascist credentials than a head of a mafia? So now you get these mafia guys in power. And as they become mayors of these towns, then this gives them the ability to control the black market in grain and food. It gives them ability, again, we're back to the same old story, patronage. It gives them ability to control land disputes. The mafia then ingrains itself into the political structure. And in classic mafia fashion, it controls the economy both through illegal means and through legal means by getting its political friends into position in controlling the vital organs of the Sicilian economy. The Mafia once again become the most powerful force in Sicily and they control the island's fate until about the 1990s. They're back. In 1945, as the fate of Sicily is transferred from the hands of one enemy into another, the war comes to an end. Spotting a chance, Lucky Luciano makes another bid for freedom. Lucky asked the New York State Parole Board to commute his sentence. Now, ironically, the man who had convicted him was Thomas Dewey. Tom Dewey was the governor of New York in 1945. When the issue came to him, he had to rely on outside agencies to tell him what Luciano had done. The Navy was embarrassed and, in effect, double-crossed Lucky. They denied that he had done anything. Despite this setback, Luciano's lawyers turned to New York District Attorney Frank Hogan, who confirms Lucky's involvement in Operation Underworld and participation in the war effort to Thomas Dewey. With the mobster's assistance verified, his sentence is commuted. Lucky Luciano wins his freedom, but there are strict conditions. What Dewey did was he commuted the sentence, 
to time served, but with the proviso that since Lucky was not an American citizen, he would be instantly deported. And if he ever returned, he would be considered an escape prisoner and would have to fulfill the whole 50 years. In February 1946, Charles Lucky Luciano is released from prison and boards a ship to Naples, where he will live out the rest of his days. He is forbidden to return to his beloved United States and will never again set foot on American soil. As one of the most powerful and notorious gangsters in the nation, Luciano's release instantly raises questions, most notably with the FBI, led by the tenacious J. Edgar Hoover. When Luciano was released in 1946, it was made very clear it was because he had helped the US government with the war. But at the time, nothing more was said. And this drove the FBI crazy. Hoover couldn't stand the idea that he didn't know about what was going on here. Suspecting corruption, the FBI opens an investigation and immediately looks at intelligence commander Charles Haffenden. They discover that since the end of the war, he's developed a close relationship with Luciano's mob associate, Frank Costello. Their subsequent reports cast doubt over Haffenden's motives during Operation Underworld, effectively ending his career. We know Haffenden played golf with Frank Costello, and Frank Costello's job in the Mafia was to play golf with politicians and functionaries like Haffenden. He was the, the, the hinge between the Mafia and politics. We can't be quite sure about Haffenden's motives. He could just be a crook. He could just have taken a big bribe. According to the, the records that Hoover was given, Costello was the one who had started the operation, was the link to Luciano, was the link to Haffenden, and so therefore Hoover said, yeah, you can't have, this guy's running around mobsters here. We can't have that stuff. So Haffenden is removed from his position because of political pressure. Once Hoover gets the whole story, he's irate. And of course, he has the famous quote of, this seems like a, a, a big abuse of power for a single mobster. I'm surprised they didn't give Luciano the Navy Cross. With Haffenden gone, Luciano deported and all naval intelligence records deliberately destroyed. For years, conspiracy theories persisted that the whole chain of events was an elaborate mafia plan, that to spring Luciano from prison, the mafia themselves had sabotaged the SS Normandy. Later investigations conclusively proved that the catalyst for this unholy alliance between the US government and the Sicilian Mafia was simply an accident. No one had sabotaged the Normandy. I think it was the timing of the burning of SS Normandy that really played into Lucky Luciano's hands. It was a major break for him because even though a lot of people said this is sabotage, it seems very clear that an investigation showed it was a pure accident. Two months after Pearl Harbor, everyone was crazy. Commander Haffenden was happy to talk to anyone. As he said, he talked to the devil himself. But of course, for Luciano, it was great timing. The best evidence was that it was an accident. So the irony is all this effort, all this planning, and Lucky Luciano's great break to get out of prison all occurred because of poor workmanship, not sabotage.